Hey, welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're, we have a delegation here at 1 o'clock. Lise Langridge, we'll welcome her up to the mic. Okay, I'm not a delegation, I'm just a single person. Um, so good afternoon and thanks for allowing me to finally come to the chambers to discuss the project that I have been doing for at least the last 10 years in regards to cemeteries. So years and years ago, I had concerns about cemeteries it, within the MD. And at the time, it was not the MD's mandate. So I was a little bit put off, but I continued on because I believed in what I was doing and I, and I knew it was the right thing to be doing. Um, so I ignored the MD and I did it on my own. But the time now has come, we need to discuss these cemeteries and make some policy changes maybe, I, I don't know. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background of how, of how I got here today. Um, so I belong to Fort Kent over there, neighboring town. And um, many of the cemeteries had fallen under Fort Kent, right? You have to understand the, the structure of, of the church there, anyway. So when we had foreign priests come over, I would accommodate them to places like Sandy Rapids and La Corrie because they had no idea where this place was. Then I began to understand things from a, from a different light, especially with unmarked graves. And I could understand what was happening. So, that, so I have a good understanding of, of that part of it. Um, from there, when they put our parish in limbo, I want to call it, many volunteers left. Who looks after the cemeteries? Anyway, that summer, I went up to uh, northern Br British Columbia. I went up to a, an Aboriginal conference, and there was a pilgrimage going on at the same time. So I was quite enlightened there about residential schools and that was all just coming, coming out. That spring, I went to the TRC hearings in Edmonton, the TRC being the Truth and Reconciliation hearings. I spent three days in these hearings, wandering around looking and trying to wrap my head around what was going on, trying to understand things. Um, so since then, I've spent much time into these conferences and trying to understand our history, which is, I now understand, very complex. So um, following those TRC hearings, I was invited to uh, Whitford Lake. So Whitford Lake has a cemetery that's in the middle of a field. And to make a long story short, somebody had taken one of the headstones and they put it on their storefront. And it bothered this old gentleman, I'm sure till this day. Anyway, he finally found the right to have that headstone put back in the cemetery. And at that time, they had down, done ground penetrating radar. So that was my first experience with ground penetrating radar, which I really didn't grasp. <laughs> anyway, so they marked out part of the area, and then they figured that there was a bunch more unmarked graves further down. We're talking very historic. So that was one thing. Then it led up to Viking. So I was invited to Viking, where um, gophers, uh, not gophers, uh, a badger had been burrowing, and next to his burrow, some bones had come up. So, of course, the RCMP had to get called. To make a long story short, an archaeological dig had to happen, 
and they determined it had been a, a, an old grave, a historic grave of a woman of some significance because of uh, the beadwork and stuff that was that was found near the thing, and they did a, an archaeological dig. So then the farmer gave permission, and they moved the, the remains to another part of his field that they wouldn't be interrupted. Uh, during that, uh, then that following spring, they had ceremony, and that's when I saw true reconciliation. That was quite an experience for me, and I wished everybody could have witnessed the, the reconciliation that happened at that time. Um, so, fast forwarding. Um, no, I'm not even following my notes. So anyway, Lakora keeps falling under my radar. I looked after Maria Cardinal for many, many years, and she taught me many things. Um, so many of the indigenous from Wolf Lake were being buried in Lakori. And she used to say, oh yeah, Elzir, Elzir is buried over there. And, you know. But what happened was they moved the fence, and pretty soon you have nobody who remembers where these graves are. So that kind of bothered me, okay? Um, so then, I don't know. I don't even know what year it was. The Alberta Archives had released um, records. So you could go into the death records, and if you're lucky, it'll tell you where the person's buried. So I started using these records. I was probably one of the first ones doing it because when I first started, it was just like, it was a learning experience for both me and I believe it was for the archives as well. So once I learned how to, how to navigate that, then I started putting things in binders. I did every cemetery that I know of within the MD. So I know the MD years ago had marked the cemeteries on a map. But I don't know if they're all marked. There's one that's missing. Um, so by doing that, then I'm able to complete the binders and say, yes, they're buried there. So um, the one that's on my radar right now is the Dumont Cemetery. I don't know whose responsibility it is or or what do we do with this place? So Norman, uh, Melvin and Norman Ward, that was before Melvin passed away, we went on a little adventure trip and uh, he showed me where, where it was. And then he took me down Wiener Hill and scared the daylights out of me. I thought that was the end of my life. He showed me another grave, but they had, somebody had like put steel fencing around and it lays peacefully. Going back, so the Dumont Cemetery and this woman are kind of buried near, not near each other, but in the same vicinity. So anyway, Melvin and I found the, the gate and somebody had put the Dumont Cemetery on there and I'm sitting there and thinking, well, whose responsibility is it to clean it or to protect it? As I'm watching across the river, the mining for gravel. And is this gonna become an issue? Are they going to start deciding to mine for gravel on this side when there's a cemetery there that really nobody knows about? So anyway, I went back to my records and I identified everybody that Melvin had told me in that cemetery and I have them all here. They are in fact buried there, absolutely 100%. But I don't know whose responsibility it is to so somewhere amongst all this mix, I was in contact with the provincial government by uh, whatever her name was. Um, and and I, I was trying to ask her, well, whose responsibility are these cemeteries? And I don't know, that one I, I believe must be on Crown land. I don't know. But it needs to be added to the MD map and I think we need to relook at all the cemeteries in the MD and properly mark them. So as I'm going, I've did, uh, once I did the Rife area, that, w that became even more complex. Iron River became a little bit of a challenge because 
Many of them are buried on the homesteads, according to the records. Now, I wouldn't have the information if they were reinterred, but I have my doubts. Um, yeah, so there's many that are just buried on homesteads. There, there's many buried all over. Like yeah, all exactly, like what happened in Viking. <laughs> so anyway, so every <clears throat> time I hear of um, unmarked graves, particularly where the residential schools are, it kind of bothers me because I'm thinking, well, why aren't you using the records? I don't think that they've done proper research. And, and that always kind of bothers me. So I kind of dabbled in areas, but the trouble is I got to pay for all this. Uh, the archives jumped from charging me 25 cents to photocopy things to a dollar a record. When you're talking about the mass amount of work I'm doing, it, it adds up. I got to pick a lot of bottles to pay for that. Uh, the other problem I have with the archives is they, they put you on a time clock. So you gotta go in to order your things. You're on this silly time clock and you get it all in and then the time runs out and you have to start all over again. And so then I learned how to stay within that time clock but then your postage and handling adds up because now I have to pay more postage and handling because of this time clock thing which is totally ridiculous but that's their rules. So that's where I'm at. I've, I, I don't know. I think you needed to be, be, you need to know what I was doing with these cemeteries. Um, it's not an easy task. Many people have passed on. The knowledge is being lost. Um, because when you do these records, you cannot go by one source of information. I have to use many different information sources. One is oral, one is the records. Uh, there's other ways to be able to 100% say they're in that cemetery. So I struggle with Lacory because I can see what's happening. It drives me nuts. Um, you know, they redid a plan. The Diocese of St. Paul redid a plan. Nobody follows it. They wasted all this money doing a plan. I don't know who keeps the records. It depends on, the records are becoming a mess. And I know that, but. But, but it's, their, it's their cemetery though, isn't it? It is. Yeah. But so what, what the other problem I have, and that's a huge problem that I have, and I think the MD needs to look at that, is what's happening over the last few years is you have People way in the past that have donated land to create a cemetery and church. Sometimes they are on different, they're, most of them are on different titles. A cemetery can never be sold. But the church property is being sold and it's creating a lot of problems with access to these old historic cemeteries. And we need to stop that before we don't have any cemeteries left. And, and, and I look at it historically in places like, um, Wo, uh, not Wostock, but out that way. If that property is not being used for church purposes, it has to get, get turned back over the crown. I have found evidence of that. So what gives the St. Paul Diocese the right to sell all these properties and creating well, that's a different, we're not talking selling properties, we're talking cemeteries, yeah. aren't we? Well, it, it's all connected. <clears throat> yeah. That's why it gets very complex. So at the end of the day, when my records are complete, I would like them to be within the MD into an archival office or some sort. So that, because over time, um, the headstones cannot be read. Uh, a lot of them are in Ukrainian or Russian. There's nobody left to interpret that. Or, and they or are nothing, deteriorating. Or nothing on them at all. Yeah. So then pretty soon you don't have a record of who's there. You know what I mean? So that's what I was working on. Okay. That's so, a lot of work. Yeah, it has been a lot of work. I've devoted 10 years of my life to it. 
you know. And <clears throat> as you know, unmarked graves are, well, now they're becoming, uh, I don't want to say a flavor of the day, but they're coming to the forefront. But I don't think they necessarily have the right tools to be saying, yes, these are buried there. I'll use Gerard for ex an example because uh, I kind of dabbled in Gerard. They did have a residential school there. I do know there was a lot of uh, negativity that happened there, but you have to also understand the history of Gerard. It was a big city in, in, our, in the beginning. And then the railway bypassed it. So you have to understand the complexities of our history, that railway dictated lots of things. Up in Lac La Biche, there's cemeteries everywhere because of the railway. And then the railway bypassed communities and these bodies are left all over. So I just felt that we needed to have a record of that. Okay. Any so I think, I don't know, did I come across? I didn't even follow my notes. <laughs> but I, yeah. I, I was just wondering if there's any questions uh, so far from council. Yeah, do you have any questions? Like, it's, it is a very complex issue. Yeah. I maybe have questions for our CAO. And, and it would be, oh. the question for the CAO would be, do we have any, uh, any records or do we do anything at all with cemeteries? Do we know who's in charge of them or who controls them? Or is it on an MD map or is they, I'm not sure. And, do, and, sh and should we? I, I don't know. Uh, uh, through the Reeve and Council to uh, Councillor Swigert, I believe we are in control of one cemetery, two cemeteries uh, in the MD. We would certainly uh, be prepared to help out with archiving of information to have an official archive. That's actually not that particularly difficult for us. In terms of all the other cemeteries that are out there, in terms of their care and control, um, that's a much more difficult question, uh, uh, particularly those that are still owned and operated or owned at least by, uh, uh, by the Roman Catholic Church or, or the Orthodox Church, those are, uh, um, if they're still under their title, then th that's still technically their responsibility. The Cemeteries Act uh, does have um, some safety valves that the cemeteries not being looked after. Uh, they do tend to come back to the municipality to, in which they reside. Um, but to date, I think, we've, uh, I think we're only responsible for the two. Um, but I said we would certainly work with um, uh, Ms. Langridge, to, uh, in terms of the archiving of the information, uh, um, she can give us copies of what she has and we can certainly um, put it into the system so that there's an official record here of the work she's done and, what, uh, um, and, and the information that she has. That's, uh, I think that's relatively, uh, that's relatively easy for us to do. We just scan it into electronic records and, and it'll be there uh, um, at least up into what has been completed. It'll be there for uh, forever. All right, thank you. Any other questions? You got another point? Go yeah, ahead. I, just what he was talking. So one of the points that I wanted to bring across was many municipalities and towns are taking over the cemeteries. And that's needs, I think that's what needs to happen here. I think we need to start looking forward and I'll use Elk Point. You have to call, call the town of Elk Point uh, most of the cemeteries are coming under municipalities or towns. They're looking after the records. Yeah. So I think it's a direction that the MD needs to at least start thinking about, not saying well, that it's not our mandate. What's the benefit of us taking over cemeteries? Like, what's it going to benefit? The then you're not going to have a big mess of. Well, <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, cemeteries are becoming a mess. Well, I don't know. I, the cemetery I take care of isn't a mess, so I, maybe yeah. there's another one, but the one yeah. I take care of isn't a mess. Yeah, I have, yeah. I have yours just, here. Yeah, it's a pretty big book. Eh? I actually, I had a Too comment much. about your cemetery. Sorry? So, I have a comment about your cemetery. I hope I'm not running out of time. So, with <laughs> your particular cemetery, um, it was never on the, anybody's radar, so I'll use... Uh, a finder grave. For, it started off, uh, there was, pr Prairie Souls had started documenting cemeteries year, years ago and then somehow in the last few years finder grave came in the picture and that's when, uh, okay, when, uh, what was the last uh, one that died in your cemetery? Um, 
um, anyway, when he died. Mr. Sebastian? No. No, Mr. Uh, uh, is it Prasovich or Klinsky? No. Mavis says that. Oh, yeah. Mild okay. Lady so when he died, honest to God, overnight that cemetery was documented. That is how fast the information is traveling. And that cemetery was documented, even though I had done it already. Find a Grave has documented it. I do have a lot of issues with Find a Grave, and that's uh, uh, confidentiality. So it just seems now that the information is like instant. And what happened to uh, privacy issues? That's the issue I have with Find a Grave. Mm. They, they're instant information. And in the, historically, in the past, things were, had to be 100 years before like, even the records I use, you can only go up to a certain year because of privacy issues. So then that falls into play. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, yeah that's just, complicated. No, I, I just think it's a good idea that we at least have archived that information. I mean, it doesn't happen often, but I have had a call from folks saying uh, they've, got to, they've got to bury somebody or whatever. How do they get hold of? You know, where would this, where's the cemetery? And I, I kind of thought the MD had a map or something with at least that on it, but I don't know. But I think it would just help if, if we kept all those records and archived them. Yeah. Uh, to the Reeve, uh, uh, the council's story, uh, yeah, the archiving, it, it certainly is not an issue. Um, the question is, where do we go past archiving? And uh, who do you, ex who do you, who would you expect to uh, update them? Well, maybe, maybe they don't get, but at least you have that historical record of a family calls you and <laughs> down the road, it could be 10 years from now. Yeah, but doesn't the church have that? Isn't that, are well, they, like, they like that's the whole reason by a church, I'm isn't it? I'm not sure, because well, in Ardmore, there is no church, right? Uh, yeah, Center there's Park. lots of unmarked graves there. There's, <laughs> there's no church anymore. So yeah, but there's, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of unmarked yeah. graves everywhere. Like, yes. And, and every, you don't know, uh, in, in, any kind of corner section can have a, on my grave, you don't know what happened 100 and some years ago. Right. <clears throat> People homesteaded. They had a, They made their own until, until they got a local cemetery, and then they started burying in the local cemetery. Right. But there's so many. You'll never find like the the world is old. <laughs> yeah. So. We have a terrible his past history. What? Uh, who was thinking about having a history 110 yeah. years ago? Yeah. Nobody. Like if you're in Europe or something, but uh, when you're homesteading. Uh, so many years ago, yeah. you you didn't have a lot of options. You know, if someone passed away, you had to bury them. Yeah, and there was lots of children. There was lots. Yeah. Well, one, one I came across was actually buried in a log, because they didn't have caskets. One yeah. was buried in a in a crate, like a, an orange crate. Shoe like boxes, crates. You bet. Yeah, they shoe did boxes. What they had to do. Yeah. A willow basket that they made. Yeah. Was, and mystery. What I'd be suggesting in terms of um, helping archive would be they'd be archived so that. You know, in the event that uh, Ms. Langridge at some point uh, moves away or that the work she's done is yeah. is here permanently, whether it was increased upon or we did anything else, at least that way there would be a record that we would have of the work then, and the uh, the 10 years of uh, documentation she's done, that that wouldn't be lost uh, um, if, if she ever left. What happens after that would yeah. be uh, for us to have a discussion about what's our, you know, the service standards and, and what we have to do with the, with the, the other cemeteries or... Okay, well, I, I'd like to thank you for, uh, you know, your presentation. I just, is there any final questions from council? Well, thank you so much. Okay. And, uh, like I say, I don't know, it, it's, it's becoming very complex, and this find a grave has made it even more complex. The other day, I had somebody come over to um, the church at Lassard. He was from Medicine Hat. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, why, why did you come here? Oh, he wants to, he was trying to get in the church. And we said, I had to say, well, no, you can't go in there. And uh, I asked him, well, what do you, how did you know this place even existed? Oh, he says, I found it on the internet. And it was, but he had the wrong information. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> anyway. Th thank you so much. Have a, okay. have a great day. Okay. And please make it your mandate. Start changing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, um, looking, f sorry. looking for a motion. 
I'd like most to accept that as information. Okay, thank you, Deputy Reeve um, Swagger, for that council accepts the presentation by Lee's Language on Cemeteries with the Municipal District of Boyle as information. Any discussion? Seeing that all those in favor? Carried. Thank you. I, not, I think someone that was going for coffee with her. No, not too sure. There's some ladies going out for coffee now. <clears throat> Seven point six. Is that all right? Six one. Yes. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Reeve, members of council. This is regarding the uh, Stars Air Ambulance request for funding. On the twenty third of February of this year, Stars Air Ambulance presented to council as a delegation where they requested continued support from the MD of Bonneville. The original request received by Stars Air Ambulance in December of twenty twenty one for funding was a commitment of ten thousand per year for the next four years. During the presentation to council, they clarified that they had revised this funding request to an annual contribution in the amount of $1 per capita for the next four years. The MD of Bonneville has historically provided annual funding to STARS as follows, uh, 2018 to 2021, $10,000, and 2015 to 2017, $12,000. According to the 2021 federal census, the current population of the MD is 11,889, and administration would recommend rounding this up to an annual contribution of 12,000 per year. Uh, attached for your review is the Appendix A, which was their delegation presentation and the letter of request uh, um, from STARS uh, to us. So uh, the cost source of funding would be the next four years funded from the grants to individuals and non-government organizations budget and our recommended actions that Council approves a contribution in the amount of 12000 annually to STARS Air Ambulance for four consecutive years effective 2022 to be funded from the grants to individuals and non-government organizations budget. Thank you, CAO. Hogan? Yes. Yeah, I think this one is a no-brainer. We see that Star <coughs> Ambulance fly out of here nonstop. Sometimes it seems like in $12,000 is a pretty small amount of pay to make sure that it's available to us when we need it. So I'll make that motion for option number one, for sure. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor. Scarson. Scarson. That council approves the, too many S's. That approves the contribution in the amount of 12000 annually to STARS Air Ambulance for four consecutive years, effectively 2022, to be funded from the grants to individual and non-government organizations' budget. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. Thank you. 762. Thank you, Mr. Reed, members of council. This is regarding the 2022 Cold Lake Air Show sponsorship update. In June of 2019, Council approved sponsoring the 2020 Cold Lake Air Show in the amount of $40,000. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the show was canceled, and in May 2020, Council approved carrying over the sponsorship to the 2022 event. The MD was contacted by Four Wing Cold Lake in February, and we have finalized the details for the MD sponsorship and processed the payment for the 2022 event. Included with the MD sponsorship for the 2022 Cold Lake Air Show is recognition as a recreation sponsor, Air show app banner advertisement, our corporate logo on 1,500 water bottles, air show program full page ad, logo on sponsored page in the Courier News, a VIP tour of Four Ring for eight people, recognition in the air show program, logo on the air show website, mention on the pre event Courier News coverage, mention on post event Courier News coverage, opportunity to display our corporate banner, post event sponsorship reception for fall of 2023. Four tickets to the Wing Commander's VIP tent and VIP parking, two on Saturday and two on Sunday. Silver corporate chalet package for 30 people, 15 people per day in a shared VIP tent, 30 official air show programs and 30 air show coins. Display area at air show by 20 by 10 and tickets to the Wing Commander's dinner and sponsor recognition by the PA announcer during the air show. That 40,000 was funded through grants to individuals and non-government organizations and our recommended action is that Council accepts the update on the 2022 Cold Lake Air Show. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, I'll make the motion to, uh, that we accept this update for, two tw for 2022 uh, Cold Lake Air Show. Okay. Thank you, Councillor, for today, uh, making the motion that Council accepts the update on 2022 Cold Lake Air Show sponsorship has information. Any discussion? Seeing that all those in favor? Carrie, thank you. 
763. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Member. The Council 763 is our. Uh, we're done already. Uh, correspondence. Yeah, sorry, 81. Uh, eight um, uh, yep. uh, or 8 is correspondence uh, and, uh, and information. Uh, the only one in there that I would point out specifically, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll also uh, um, pass this on to uh, Ms. Kimbao, is the letter from Aurora Visual Arts with a request for support. And we'll see uh, what grant that, uh, what grant program that may uh, that may qualify under. Are, are you familiar with? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. CAO. Um, I have been in touch with uh, Ms. Poole, who is heading up uh, this special event happening at the end of May. She is just sending us a little bit more information. Um, depending on the request currently, they are requesting we waive or we assist them with the funding to uh, cover the rental costs for these workshops at the Centennial Centre. So she is just sending in confirmed costs for that. And um, if it's a sponsorship request or of 2000 or less, or if it's over 2000 to determine where it goes. Yeah, I talked to Leone as well, and it's for two classrooms for two days. So, um, are you able to cover that with your? She said she was going to you for grants or whatever, and she was turned down from any provincial grants. I guess she was applying for. Yes, yeah, she had submitted an application to the Alberta Foundation of the Arts. Unfortunately, uh, and that was for around six or seven thousand dollars that she was looking for. Um, and that was turned down. This is something actually uh, we did pull previous um, givings. They have held this back in 2020 where the MD uh, was asked <coughs> to approve a contribution of $2,500. <coughs> At that time, we only approved a contribution of $1,000. Um, all of this information, um, once uh, Leona has a chance to send in the actual financials for this year because we don't have what her expenses 100% are or what uh, revenue that she's received from the town, for example, as well. Just a, sorry, I'm kind of going on. Um, through the Community Action Grant, if it's over, if it's between a thousand and five thousand dollars, they are required to submit project expenses or what their estimated project expenses are going to be. So that's that's the one piece we're waiting on just to confirm where uh, we can process their request through. So you, I, I guess just you can you should be able to to cover it through without a council motion. I guess is what I'm asking. That is highly likely. Yeah. Yes. And if it is under two thousand dollars and it fits within our currently amended uh, sponsorship donations policy, uh, the CAO may choose to do that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Kimball. <clears throat> you're, you're done then, Al? Yes, sir. Reports from Council then? i start with, sorry, I need a motion too, yep. Yep. I'll make Council that motion okay. to accept this as information. Okay. You almost made it to the end. Oh, I did. <laughs> I screwed up there. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor uh, Fidel, for making that motion. That we accept that as information. Uh, any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. Thank you. All right. Okay, Ben, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, pretty quiet uh, week except for RMA. I think we made some uh, good progress there as far as the uh, council as a whole and uh, CEO made some good contacts with uh, some uh, key people at the uh, government of Alberta, so which is great. And uh, yeah, that is that is it. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Reeve uh, Swiger. Oh, you're jumping right to me. Thank you. Yep. Well, we might as well get the, the long one over. <laughs> that, was, that was an RMA like everyone. Yes. Um, I will mention though we did uh, Sure, talk about we did meet with Minister Nixon, Alberta Environment and Parks. I was really impressed actually because he brought his whole entourage with him. He probably had a half, he probably had a dozen, yep, or so people with him, and he listened, you know, very well to our concerns. And uh, he uh, had made, I think, some of his staff made contact with uh, with Mr. Vespelko. I guess we're dealing with some 
Alberta Environment and Parks issues, and it had to do with um, them t trying to get rid of the red tape reduction. They implemented a new digital regulatory as assurance program system that Mr. Vespalco apparently is familiar with, but it was causing him grief. So I think they were sort of trying to guide us through that system to speed up some of our issues. So it was all good. We talked, uh, yeah, had some good discussion with him about the ski hill also, and so, and you can probably add to that. Um, I guess I won't say much more about that. It was just a good convention. Okay, Councillor Slipchuk. No, I have nothing. It was quite weak. Councillor Crick. Missing that. Yeah. Um, this year. Keeping you on your toes, eh? <laughs> so on the 10th, 10th of March, we had emergency ma municipal emergency training. That was a good one in uh, Kitscotty. And thank you to Louis Gandalfi for the work that you're doing here in the MD on that. Um, yeah, convention was good. We had a chance to speak with some of the MLAs, so that was, that was productive. And then a BRFA board meeting. And uh, hasn't happened yet, but Saturday the 26th, the Beaver Dam Community Hall is having our supper. And that'll be a great supper for anybody who wants to come out to that. So, it's a fundraiser for the hall, so just come on. Are you buying uh, tickets for all of us uh, that are coming? <laughs> Thanks, Josh. I'll see if Esther's got a grant for that. <laughs> <laughs> are you supplying the meat, Josh? No, it's Betty Davidick's cooking, and you don't, oh, yeah. and you don't well, want to just, miss it. If, if Betty Davidick's cooking, is worth uh, worth going. How much? How much are tickets? I think it's eighteen for an adult, and I'm not sure about kids, but my kids are coming anyways. I'll pay for them. They're worth it. You want to go last or, or last or first? Yeah, you okay, Councillor Gravia. There's negotiations <laughs> happening here. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was at RMA. And uh, while well, you all were there, there was some discussion there of ambulance shortages and also the culture of AHS has to change. And then I had BRFA, nothing new to report there except we have a <coughs> mutual fire aid agreement with Kehiwin, and that's about it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scarson. <coughs> yeah, so uh, again, RMA as well. And then um, there was a, I went to the Chamber of Commerce AGM yesterday and um, I'll just I'll got rattle off a few. Uh, their new executive, Lee's Fielding, was uh, was there before Kate, as president, vice president Caitlin Bush and treasurer Sarah Herjavis and secretary Sharla McCullough, and just a couple of highlights of some things that they got going on the the chamber in Bonneville is um, they've got 17 different events planned for 2022, so they're very busy. Um, uh, one being the oil and gas show, of course. Uh, they're setting up the Chamber Market website, which is uh, helps promote local uh, shopping in Bonneville and Alberta kind of thing. Um, and the other one was uh, one they're coming out with is a shop local card that they uh, they've got some grant for, so you can buy a card for hundred dollar card for seventy five dollars and um, a fifty dollar card for forty dollars, and they're only uh, you're only able to use them in uh, businesses in Bonneville or the MD as well. So. Uh, those will be coming out here soon as well, so kind of a neat, neat promotion. And then the other one was uh, tomorrow for anyone, I think we all got the email, is the uh, Part 9 training um, that the C2 is putting on uh, in conjunction with the town, but it was invited to all the councillors as well, so I know that uh, if, if you want some information about how Part 9s work and all that stuff, it would be a good one to attend. I think it's 9 till 12, so it's only a three-hour sit-down, so that's it. That's true. Yes. I, you rushed me, so I did. Okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> you knew that was coming, right? No, uh, no I couldn't I, believe it. I was the shortest one I've ever seen you do. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I just had to talk a little bit about asset management because, I, you know, we we're, we're very proud of the MD to have Esther uh, Kienbau as kind of our asset management driver, and she actually gave a really good presentation at RMA, and Excellent. and well, it was very good. We were proud of her. Um, yeah. and, and then I just wanted to say one other thing. Uh, pre-approved regulatory zones because um, there was discussion about that at RMA a, f a few some of these different seminars and I'm, I'm just thinking we got to consider that you know for this carbon capture storage if that ever comes to our area if we could have a pre-approved area that was zoned for that then then it skips a lot of the hoops that they'd have to jump through to for zoning and that sort of thing so I don't know how we do that but I just think we should be doing something act proactive all right, you stole a bit of my thunder. Um, I was 
we were, we also met we met with the minister Nixon that was awesome uh, it was very first class he came in with uh, with the army and they were they weren't just sitting there uh, twiddling their thumbs they're all pretty attentive and I'd like to thank Al and uh, yourself and our uh, MLA came in and Hanson came in as well and uh, the Spunkle. <laughs> thank you for all great job you guys done that was really really well done um, also Esther I think you're the first one to present from the MD forever. I don't remember anyone ever, and I was, uh, I didn't really hear much of what you said, but I was so proud that you were up there, and I did hear what you said, but <laughs> I was, uh, I was pretty proud that you were up there, and uh, I was like, hey, that's our, our girl from our MD speaking to the, everybody throughout Alberta, so it was a pretty big moment for us, and I think we should try to do that more. Uh, we should get our MD, uh, out there more because we are uh, we are a going concern here. Uh, just want Al to touch on. Uh, you shared with us about this Ukrainian thing that happened. Can you share and uh, tell how Louis got this going for us, please? Uh, so yes, thank you. Um, uh, I'll just start with a big thank you to uh, uh, Louis Gandolfi. I received an email from Louis on Monday morning, I believe it was, uh, that uh, there was this airlift being planned. That I think is uh, I think. Uh, the big airlift, I think, is being planned by the premier, the previous premier, Ed Stelmack. Yes. And uh, Louis said, hey, is there something we can do? Uh, we've got an emergency operations trailer. Can we organize something locally uh, to get the donations? And I said, absolutely, do whatever you want, run with it. Um, and uh, here we are today with probably a trailer full of, of goods and supplies. I think one of our peace officers is driving down at some point later this afternoon, if not right away. And uh, we'll be delivering that uh, on behalf of the municipality, uh, the MD of Bonneville, um, in, in an effort to assist uh, the people of Ukraine who are going through a pretty tough time right now. So I just want to say thank you to, uh, to Louis. And Louis, did you have anything you'd like to offer or anything you'd like to add to, uh, to that? Yeah, I'm just proud of all the people in our region that stepped up and uh, I just had a little girl, she wanted to take a picture with me this morning, I'm going to reach out, her name was uh, Maggie Hutchison and she raised uh, $700 on herself, she's just a little maybe 12 years old uh, girl from the area, I don't know if she's from the town of Bonneville or MD of Bonneville, doesn't matter, she raised like $700 and she bought all these little goods and she brought them in on a, a bunch of bags with her mother this morning, she's, so I got to reach out and say good job. This, you know, she wanted the picture. It's pretty humbling. Uh, this little girl did seven hundred dollars. That's amazing. Um, Mr. Reeve, yes. I just want to add. It's uh, uh, former Premier Stalinak and also Thomas Lukasik, who was one of the ministers. That both of them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, also, you know, I'm, I'm glad Councillor Fideo brought up that about you know our ambulance services and, and shortage of doctors. Like I said, we we had a, a meeting with the. The Reeves and Mayors at the RMA, and uh, I got a hold of our CEO, and he's supposed to reach out to our uh, fire chief and uh, our deputy fire chief, and they're supposed to send information on uh, how it's run here in our area, because uh, our, our RMA president wants to get a bunch of stuff and then sit down with the minister on behalf of all of Alberta, rural or Alberta, to get something going or from the RMA. So that was that's pretty huge. Uh, it's a when, if you're sitting at the RMA, that's a big, big top topic that was there. And I also said uh, uh, set, uh, had a BFRA meeting, and Josh and Mike told us about it. So thank you, everyone. I guess we need to need a. We have in cameras. We need a motion to go in camera. Thank you, Councillor Kravak. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. All right, we came out of camera. We have no motions to make, and uh, Councillor Slipchick uh, came out. Of, and who's going to make the motion to end the meeting? Councillor Crick uh, makes a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Over and out.